Hi, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, wherever in the world you are. We welcome you to the third day of the 14th Sankalp Global Summit, where we are talking about transforming impact. This particular session is the ESG masterclass for entrepreneurs. And we are here to talk about a very interesting and important topic affecting companies today, which is ESG. Is ESG a noun, pronoun? What is it? We all have heard so many terms about ESG and navigating the ESG soup and alphabet. How do we sail the rough seas of ESG? Well, we look at it as a way for businesses to communicate message to their stakeholders, showing that the business cares not only about what it's doing, but also society and environment uh, at large. It is not just about risk management. It is also about long-term value creation. But the question arises, how? We are all very aware of the why. And I, here we are with experts in the field to discuss the how. We have three experts, uh, practitioners in ESG who will be talking, taking us through how ESG can be embedded in your company, how you can effectively implement a gender action plan, and finally, how you can do ESG scoring for your company. At the, uh, I'll introduce each uh, speaker and I also like them to say a few words about uh, themselves. Um, and then I will just uh, uh, hand over the session to Somajit to begin. So as I mentioned, we have uh, three distinguished speakers. We'll be starting with uh, uh, Somajit Mondal, who is the principal at IntelliCap. Uh, Somajit has over 17 years of experience and across the dom domains of climate change, sustainability, and ESG. He'll be speaking on embedding ESG uh, in your company. Uh, Somajit, would you like to just uh, say a few words? Uh, sorry, Somajit, I think you're on mute. Uh, we are not able to hear you. Is it better? Yes, yeah works okay. go ahead yeah so yeah delighted to be here thanks what's up thanks everyone for having me here thanks to sankal and yeah looking forward to discussing the uh, why's and what's and how's of the basics of ESG. thank you uh, over to you priya priya uh, let me just say a few words about you uh, priya has been a passionate uh, advocate of esg she has over 13 years of sustainability and esg related experience and currently, she's the vice president of ESG at Obimet, where she leads the ESG efforts for all Obimet funds. She spearheaded various diversity-related initiatives with a focus on gender in uh, multinational companies as well as startups. Uh, over to you, Priya. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Utsa. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Um, I'm delighted to be here and hope to take you through some, um, you know, some of the learnings that I've had over the past uh, few years of practice from implementing a gender action plan. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you Priya. Next, we have John, who is the CEO and principal consultant of Basic Group. Previously, he served as the CEO and vice chair of the Kenya Green Building Society. He is also an accredited lead green associate and IFC edge expert and envision sustainability professional and has over 18 years experience in providing property condition assessments and green building certification along with ESG responsible investing and a host of other activities. Thank you for joining us, John, and over to you for a quick introduction. Thank you so much, Yudsar, for that wonderful presentation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. As introduced, I'm John Cabrier. So I'll be talking about a practical example of how to uh, integrate uh, uh, ESG into uh, a business, regardless of whether ready so and make it influential for you. So I'll be talking about that once the time, the time comes. Thank you. Great, thank you, John. We lost you there for a quick second, but uh, I think we'll uh, we got the gist, and we'll come uh, back to you during your presentation. Um, uh, for everyone else, I recommend also please put forward your questions to the uh, speakers in the chat and introduce yourself. And we hope to this this uh, session to be very very interactive. 
So please do ask your questions. And finally, I come back to what I said earlier, whether ESG is a noun or a pronoun. I would like to leave our audience with the message that uh, ESG is an adjective. It's not a matter of compliance or labeling things or just, you know, following regulations. But the true task for companies is to realize their interdependence with stakeholders and then focus on what matters for long-term growth of economy, society, and the environment. So thank you. With that, I hand it over to Swamijit for his presentation. Uh, just uh, we'll give him a second to uh, put up the presentation. So will it be possible from your end? Yes, yes. Is it visible? Yes, for me. Uh, okay. So, uh, if you can just move on from the first slide onward. So. Okay, so hello again and welcome everyone and thanks for having me here uh, to share our learnings and experience on ESG and or uh, sustainability strategy and reporting and or what is more uh, popularly known today as ESG readiness or environmental, social and governance readiness. So the terms ESG and sustainability are often used uh, interchangeably. So before we start our presentation, a uh, short brief, uh, uh, ESG is a term that was coined with a focus on the investment vertical. That is to help uh, basically primarily the investors better understand the functioning of the company and the prospects of its growth with regard to the rapidly changing risk landscape. And now it is a focus for everyone from regulators to consumers. Uh, the term sustainability covers a much broader domain uh, of which ESG is a part. And sustainability can be related or applied to any entity from an individual to the functioning of an entire nation and includes parameters beyond the metrics applicable for a company. Uh, so we will discuss this brief briefly during the presentation too. And now our today's presentation is divided into uh, three brief parts. And we'll try to share as many real life examples as possible as we go along so that it is easier for you to uh, relate with the concepts. So first we'll understand when uh, what all is happening, happening around us. Uh, second, what we need to do in order to uh, deal with this fast evolving uh, ESG landscape. And third, how we need to act or implement the required action plans. So uh, what do you see in this slide? We have to understand and acknowledge that the scenarios we used to expect and envisage earlier as future scenarios, they are already here. Things like increasing number of cyclones, forest fires, floods due to climate change, increasing conflicts and migration because of depletion of natural resources, ranging from minerals and fuels to water, uh, increasing rate and severity of diseases, pandemics due to the decreasing forests, biodiversity. So under such circumstances, do we need to reimagine like, what would make a greater and better business sense? Now, what is important to understand here is that the planet can do and will do whatever is required to save itself. We have to act now to save ourselves. That is our industries, our livelihoods, our societies and our environment which supplies us with all the necessary raw materials necessary for our survival. So in this slide, this slide shows basically the, some of the new snippets for only a like, few of the several such uh, events which are creating waves in the business world. And this does not even include the direct physical impacts on the supply chains and communities from climate change induced uh, calamities. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, now uh, sustainability or ESG is not something that has jumped out of like thin air now. Uh, if you see the different vertical threads here, uh, it represents the different types or categories of stakeholders that have joined this uh, realization. Uh, it started off with the regulators, then moved on to the policymakers and then to the activists. Uh, and finally to the uh, investors. Uh, today, uh, every company from every sector that has a significant scale of operations and therefore has a substantial uh, scale of influence and impact over its stakeholders and surroundings, uh, that is both society and environment, has adopted or has initiated the process of adopting sustainability agenda and incorporating the ESG criteria into its strategy, governance, operations and disclosures. 
so we are currently moving very fast into the transformation era where global perception about sustainability is transforming and becoming stronger every day as a result of which organizations are transforming their business models and strategies so it was initiated in the 1980s it started developing rapidly at the turn of the millennium and now we are mainstreaming sustainability uh, in our business we are now entering the transformation era where stakeholder capitalism has begun so what is that uh, it means we need to demonstrate the value to every type of stakeholder equally and not just our shareholders or just our investors it is about your consumers about your regulators and policy makers it is about your communities that is you need to have that social license to operate that is how you can mainstream sustainability into your business uh, next slide please so you can clearly see from this snapshot how this uh, how over this same span of time as shown in the previous slide uh, how the methods of estimating company valuation has also been changing very clearly how gradually and steadily the intangibles and non financials have become the primary factors responsible for the final valuation of a company and most if not all of these former of these factors or aspects you would find to be included as part of the sustainability or esg standards and frameworks uh, next slide please now let us quickly uh, see and understand what is sustainability and esg all about and what they are now uh, they are now in the focus why they are now in the focus of all the categories of stakeholders around the world uh, regulators investors business everyone uh, since it is easier to relate to facts and figures compared to dry theories uh, i will try to present the ideas with such uh, relatable examples so in this slide while in the lower half you will find a mix of uh, qualitative and quantitative risks so quantitative risk like water energy crisis pollution cyber threat qualitative risk like corruption erosion of trust and safe workplace uh, in the upper half you can find the financial implications of some of these risks or business entities on business entities around the world as estimated by cdp a significant percent of these risks is the result of these very economic activities be it uh, business actions or government policies and programs uh, next slide please and this is exactly the reason why stakeholders became gradually curious about not just the economic or financial outputs but the consequences of these outputs also so as things like loss of natural area and biodiversity income equality are becoming more and more conspicuous people are realizing that the successful company is no longer one that just just makes money what matters is also the way you make it because where will growth come from when planetary and social boundaries are breached Uh, this is an overview of the benefits and costs of the green revolution program of india initiated in the 1960s uh, what was immediately noticed and accounted for was of course the economic benefits at that time like huge agricultural prosperity social benefits like food security the costs of the externalities was hardly accounted for though suffered extensively like wide scale soil and water pollution biodiversity loss pesticides in foods in other words the true value and impact of a policy or program can be assessed only if we take into account the costs of the environmental and social consequences too uh, next slide please again uh, earlier investors financiers and most stakeholders including banks were primarily interested in the financial performance of a company but modern approaches are taking into account the externalities thus being able to arrive at an integrated value based on the environmental and social capital or value created by the company the table above shows uh, how the, the 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 positive value perceived earlier uh, based on only the financial profit of a, a sample tobacco company here uh, becomes negative when the effects or costs of tobacco consumption on the society are taken into account uh, similarly the graph below uh, shows the how the dollar value of a company's non financial impacts affect the true value of a company uh, next slide please yeah uh, i would like to quickly touch upon a few popular and easily comprehensible visual representations of what therefore sustainability is uh, for those who love maths and graphs sustainable development is depicted by the area uh, shaded in blue in the diagram on the left hand side uh, where the said area is below uh, the horizontal line depicting the li uh, limits of natural resources uh, and on the right of the threshold value of the human development indicator in other words an entire uh, an entity operating in that shaded area uh, signifies that it is operating within the natural and social thresholds depicted by the donut model on the right side uh, this model developed by uh, british economist kate reworth uh, depicts that the area between the planetary ceiling and the social foundation as the safe and just space for humanity uh, next slide 
uh, a couple of more uh, visuals uh, to understand the components of uh, sustainable development. So when we are assessing matters of national or larger scales, we use this grouping on the left hand side known as the wedding cake uh, representation. Uh, now you can easily figure out that in such a structure, the foundation is the most important in absence of which the upper structures will fall apart. So you see assessing nations with respect to only economic parameters or indicators like GDP, GNP, et cetera, will not yield the true or correct picture of the performance. Instead, we must take into account along with the ind uh, economic ind uh, indicators, the human development and ecological development indicators also. Uh, just like we showed in the previous slides for the corporate sector. Uh, the right hand figure is what we call a nested model where you can see the within the brackets the respective uh, in the respective spheres in the three spheres the six capitals which are essential for the operation and sustenance of business uh, these are the natural capital in the environment sphere the social human and intellectual capitals in the society sphere and the financial and manufactured capitals in the economy sphere uh, this representation is used to explain an approach called the multi capital assessment model which is based on the principle that impacts and influences of a business activity must be measured independently with respect to the carrying capacity of the vital capitals. So the learning from the last few slides is that it is not just enough to measure the outside in impacts or the impacts of the environment, economy, society on your company or business, but also the inside out impacts or the impacts of your business activities on the world. Why the second part is also necessary because the risks caused by your company uh, for the society, economy and environment does not go unnoticed and comes back as a, as, a, as a cost to you only. For example, if you're withdrawing water at a rate beyond the recharge of the water source or beyond the carrying capacity of the watershed, uh, it is bound to affect the community and the economy. And this will have repercussions, not just in the form of regulatory risk, but also the reputational risks and eventually operational risk. So if you can just move on to... Uh, Next slide. Uh, so, so this is basically an overview of the primary uh, factors, ESG aspects that are being taken into account. Uh, I'll be just moving quickly since we took quantity of time. Uh, to uh, so, you can just move on to a couple of slides more. Please go on. One more. One. Yeah, so I'll just uh, end with this slide. Uh, so the ESG journey helps us move the focus of our business to create value from our share, uh, shareholder focus to stakeholder primacy. Uh, this is what is known as basically stakeholder capitalism, as I said. So uh, from the left hand bottom, if you go like clockwise, uh, so you have to start by mapping your entire ecosystem of stakeholders uh, and you have to demonstrate to them that you are creating impact for them in terms of real value. And what is equally important is what you are, uh, how you are quantifying that impact. Uh, investors are, are asking for data which is actionable because this is the data they are going to use to influence the decisions. And this is the data you will help, that will help you access newer streams of uh, revenue. Second, uh, business risks. So business risks are not just the ones that are immediate to you, but also the risks that are accessed uh, across your value chain. Uh, identifying those business risks, analyzing what is the best mitigation measure for those risks and being able to create the kind of resources, the kind of capital that you need to be able to address those risks is absolutely important. The next one is value creation and value-driven opportunities. Uh, how we can use this process and this report to unlock some of the business opportunities that will become the needs of the uh, future. Uh, next is, of course, the sustainability report or ESG report, which can help you with what we call lead with impact. And I'm sure you must have heard of these uh, international platforms like WPCSD, GRI, and the related sustainability portals. So what do, do these platforms actually help you do? It helps you communicate your story. So by communicating how you graduated from being just a compliance meter to a vanguard of sustainability really helps not only your brand to lead with impact, but also help the others in your industry to see you as a trendsetter, to help them understand that these are some of the changes that they too are facing as a business and so they can follow and like replicate those things. And finally, most important is EHG, uh, not EHG, but EHG, which is called like eyewash, hogwash, greenwash. So there have been a significant number of incidents in the recent past where companies have been pulled up for coming up with reports having more of a like PR and marketing spin than the actual initiatives. 
Uh, fact is, investors are easily able to cut through those noises and just pick up the signals because that's all they need to understand. So just give them that part of the information. Be alert when you are where you are crossing the boundaries of ESG and stepping into these rabbit holes of EEG that are not required. So I guess I'll end it uh, here and I'll just hand over to Sir and take the questions when as they come. Thanks. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Swamijit, for that very informative uh, presentation. You started with saying that businesses need a social license to operate. And you ended with EHG, which is eyewash, hogwash, and greenwash. So uh, that's quite interesting. And uh, an immediate question which comes to mind is that when you speak about the social license to operate, if there are no legal repercussions, if there are no financial uh, repercussions or penalties, for companies, why should they adopt ESG? I'm sure that's a question on everyone's mind that first of all, it's confusing, there's so much, and it's a cost center. So why, why uh, you know, all these things, they sound nice that we're doing things for society, we're doing things for environment, but as a business, are there emerging real legal repercussions? Are there real financial costs for ignoring uh, uh, this, um, uh, you know, trend of ESG? You want me to answer now, sir? Yes, yes. And uh, then I'll go on to the questions uh, in the chat. And I encourage everyone to add their questions in the chat for Swamjeet. Thank you. Sure, sure. So as I said, like if you see uh, what we call double materiality, so it is not just because you are doing a favor to yourself, you are, or sorry, you are doing a favor to the world by uh, reporting or acting in the ESG according to the ESG standards, but you are doing a favor to yourself because whatever harms you are like, to, uh, are, uh, which is resulting from the economic activities or any other activities uh, which you are like where you are breaching the boundaries as I showed the donut model and all those things. So it will be coming back to you. I mean, it is based, it is your survival that you are looking after, right? If the if the natural resources st stop coming in, if you are like, if the, the uh, social or the communities have, there's a backlash among the communities or from the regulatory things. I mean, I'm forgetting the regulatory things. It is the communities that you are catering to, right? If the consumers stop taking your things because of the reputation that you have built for yourself. So it is the harm that you are doing to yourself. So it is not just basically compliance or like uh, risk mitigation for yourself, but you have to create that value. So it is from risk mitigation to value creation that you have to like uh, make the journey. And it is for yourself only. I hope that uh, answers the question. That's helpful. Thank you. And uh, Swamiji, just as a follow-up, if you're not in an industry like, let's say, manufacturing or oil and gas or plastics, uh, you're maybe in insurance or banking, you're not causing direct harm to the environment uh, uh, from a day-to-day -day, uh, business perspective. So so your employees are not uh, you know, feeling like they're causing pollution or they're releasing something dangerous in the environment. How should, uh, uh, you know, institutions with perhaps no direct impact think about uh, embedding ESG and what part of the business value chain do they need to kind of focus on where perhaps uh, emissions and, you know, other pollution related things are arising? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I think, I mean, uh, what we generally focus on nowadays is more on the E part, right? I mean, what you just mentioned comprises most, mostly the E part. So what is important very uh, much for industries also is the G and S part also. So for S part, like what are the products that are, or what, what are the items that we are uh, getting into the products or services, how we are delivering those things, how we are treating our customers, what is the product stewardship or service stewardship that we are looking after. On the governance side, maybe the, uh, the, the gender diversity within our company or in the board, or the uh, uh, deviation in the like uh, in the uh, salaries or all those things how we are dealing with cyber threats so all these things are very important too so we have to think beyond the traditional uh, the climate and uh, the carbon and all those things or the environmental the waste management or plastics packaging as you said so all these things are very important to to help you to help not only build the morale of the like internal employees and the uh, investors too but the consumers also to see to help you build the reputation that you want for yourself. Sure, thank you. We have two quick questions from the audience and then I'll move on to Priya. Uh, first question, Swamijit, is what kind of incentives are currently available for companies to extend their sustainability targets to focus to their supply chain partners? Uh, do you think the onus of the reporting of these metrics should be on the companies or the state? 
This is a I good question. So there are both, I mean, the uh, compliance uh, regime and the voluntary regime. So in the compliance, of course, you have to do it to, in order to mitigate your, your risks, as I said, the regulatory risks and all those things. But on the voluntary part, what it helps you is to access capital at a lower cost from investors when you are uh, showing compliance uh, with these standards, the popular standards like GRI, what they prescribe, or other uh, lot of standards are there, UNGC, compact principles, and all those things are there. So once you start showing that you are actually helping create value, as I'm saying uh, uh, every time, that you are helping create value for not only yourself, but all your stakeholders that are along the supply chain, uh, which helps you like, again, I mean, when we are talking about supply chain, it's basically the core uh, uh, operations of your, especially for the manufacturing industry, it's only like 20% in the, the emissions that are happening or the activities that are happening are only like 20% of uh, is included in the code operations. But 80% is like spread over the supply chain. So if you are helping create value in your supply chain members also, that gives your brand uh, a huge enhancement. It helps you get into newer markets. It helps you uh, reduce your operational and supply chain costs and all those things. So it, it is, again, doing a favor for yourself where you are creating value for everyone. So it is beyond the compliance. Sure, thank you. There's a question from Akbar uh, who's asking about, he thinks that the ESG needs to be driven by financial services. So do you see banks and financial institutions providing concessional finance and better terms to ESG compliant firms versus other uh, firms who are not adopting ESG? And uh, to Akbar, I think you uh, will also find this question answered by John to some extent. Um, but yeah, over to you, Somaji. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, since they are one of the most important stakeholders uh, in the supply chain, uh, I think it is uh, there lies a huge responsibility with them and for it is again for themselves only to cater to or to uh, yeah to service these companies which are actually creating more value. So it is the value is created for the investors also or for the financiers or banks also, right? I mean, the uh, the cost of capital comes down and then uh, the the it is more. Uh, uh, the liabilities come down. That is what. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that is the answer, short answer. Okay. Thanks a lot, Swamijit. Uh, Anshul, I have taken note of your question and I'll ask it again at the end. Uh, for now, in the interest of time, we'll move on to Priya. Uh, over to you, Priya. Thank you. Thanks, Swamijit. That was a very interesting session. Thank you, Utsa. Uh I will just share my screen. I will take you through um, this in the form of a presentation. Of course, questions are welcome. Um, just give me a second here. Is everything okay? Is everything visible? Okay. Um, thanks so much. Uh, first of all, good morning uh, to all the attendees and my fellow panelists. Thank you for joining us for this session. My name is Priya Malabanur. Today, I hope to share with you some of my learnings and successes and failures um, of implementing an effective gender plan. It's, it's you know, you, you don't always get it and you don't always achieve what you set out to. And I think there's a lot of learnings from that. Um, I've worked in the space of, uh, just a moment, sorry. I worked in the space of ESG more broadly, um, uh, for the last many years, with gender diversity as an important component throughout my career. I've witnessed a lot changing for women at workplace since I myself started out in the workforce. Um, I'm deeply passionate about this topic and excited to share my experience with all of you here. So without further ado, and maybe shifting gears a little bit from what we've already spoken about, uh, you know, we will jump into a little bit of decoding what this session actually means and what it what it looks uh, to achieve. Over the last two days, with the incredible lineup at Sankalp, um, I've heard several esteemed panelists on various gender-related aspects. I think gender has been pretty center stage in most of the dis uh, discussions that I've attended so far. Some I recall or uh, are uh, how do care businesses um, enhance outcomes for women and girls. Uh, there was a session on stumbling blocks and ways forward for gender inclusion, uh, which I found very interesting. Climate change and gender um, and, and many other uh, sessions. Um, so today's session, I hope to build on these topics and with specific steps for entrepreneurs um, 
you know what what you could do in order to incorporate a gender lens to your business activities i will try and provide a broad guidance and try and not be prescriptive but depending on the stage of company um uh, you know and your experience in implementing such programs i think you may find both of these a little bit uh, useful in terms of what you'd like to take away um so just in terms of uh, you know perhaps uh, defining uh, what is gender action i think gender action is deliberate and intentioned efforts to narrow gender disparities through companies operations and products or services that is what gender action means for a company um in terms of like the various ways of addressing it two common concepts that keep coming up um while i don't want to get it caught up in the, in this jargon you know but it's important to perhaps just introduce you to two two words that uh, or rather two phrases that you will keep see- hearing in this field so one is gender equity which is essentially if um you know your products and services or the way your company operates does it provide equal access to opportunities uh for women and men uh that is what gender equity sort of represents uh in terms of gender mainstreaming it it really talks about gender concerns being incorporated at every stage of operations or product or service so this will include uh like specific products uh for uh, and services for women um uh, you, you know for example microfinance products uh and and other such things specifically uh designed for women why gender action um you know i will i will assume that this audience here today is sold on gender inclusion and and on why gender action um i will highlight that in the interest of time that this discussion on why is a little bit out of scope for today's session a quick brief is that you know there is disparity uh we we can, we can all do something to address these disparities and it is also in our best interest to narrow these disparities in whatever ways we can um this this might sound a little bit uh, uh you know um macro but some of these benefits also include wider talent pool lower cost of talent improved productivity with more inclusive organization culture um access to new markets where women are consumers or girls are consumers and access to capital of course you know through various initiatives like 2x challenge and so on um but uh, let's not spend too much time on this i think i want to get into a little bit of how we can implement it and that will add more context to how um, or how we go about these things So in order to address this problem which we acknowledge already that it is there that there are disparities <laughs> it would be good to contextualize some of these reasons as to why there are these disparities right um a lot of what you see here um and i'm trying to keep this very specific to workforce and you know very specific to how businesses deal with it um but there are a lot of ex- ex- external and complex factors uh that influence Uh, or that has created these impediments uh, to gender equality um some of these are societal expectations um including the uh, care providing unpaid work um uh, unsafe work conditions or general lack of physical security and autonomy for women disproportionate illiteracy including financial illiteracy um most of uh, uh, the you know uh workforce like two thirds of world's illiterate adults are women uh so there's clearly some kind of a um a lack of access to education there um and and also lack of access to services including healthcare banking and others um i think all of these factors sort of come together in order to um accentuate this disparity it is completely unreasonable to believe that all these challenges can be solved by one company or one startup um but there are tangible steps that each of us could take uh, you know getting to uh, that direction so let us determine what makes sense to do and break it down into perhaps my effort today will be to really break it down and see how it applies to each of us so these are some of the most common um perhaps um uh 
uh, actions that you that you will see uh, in in when whenever anybody talks about gender inclusion or diversity initiatives uh, from a corporate perspective. And these are all important. But if you uh, you know, let's get into the specifics and see how to develop and implement a gender action plan, right? Um, so the first step uh, is that even before we get into the first step, I think one thing to remember is that these are not standalone plans. I want to just caution the audience here a little bit on um, thinking about each of these as a separate project or a separate uh, standalone plan, right? These are to be incorporated into the way perhaps you do business or like I call it, apply a gender lens to the project plans that you already have. And that might bring out a lot of interesting um, avenues for which uh, in which you could potentially work on. But nevertheless, let's just go through some of these steps. If you were to do, uh, if you were to have a gender action plan, or if you were to apply a gender action plan onto your existing plan, right? So first examine the value chain and determine the sphere of influence. Now we can talk about it in the context of uh, a company or a project, right? So examine what is that project or the company, examine the value chain and determine the sphere of influence that you, you carry on these. Conduct a gender analysis uh, on these, you know, identify, first of all, how these projects or where are the impact on gender uh, on each of these, each of the different steps of your project and benchmark these uh, once you identify this. This um, is is perhaps the larger chunk of of the entire sort of uh, the gender action plan. Uh, I would urge uh, you to spend a lot of time here. Um, there are no um, set uh, sort of like you know th there's no easy way to do this. There's a lot of I think thought that goes into it. And while we will go through some of the immediate ways on how you could, um, you know, arrive at this, but here is where you will be spending quite a lot of time. And then determine the objective of the gender action plan. Once you determine all these, um, you know, the once you conduct the analysis, have the benchmark, determine gaps, then you will see what from these gaps can you, it make sense for you to address and design the programs to address these gaps. I cannot stress this enough. Once you get to this point, conduct awareness and secure stakeholder buy-in. All plans will fall flat if you do not have stakeholder buy-in. And, and especially when you're talking about something like a gender action plan, do not exclude men from this plan. I think it's very important to secure the buy-in of all the participants of this plan. Um, allocate budgets necessary. There are some things that are low-hanging fruits in terms of budgets. Some don't require any budgets. Some require additional budgets. Figure that out, what makes sense for the organization, and, and allocate budgets as necessary. Implement and monitor these programs. Measure and report progress. Again, can't stress enough with respect to any project or plan. You must have a way to uh, measure uh, and monitor the progress. And set up feedback loops and adjust the plan as necessary. I think it's very important, especially with something uh, about gender, to hear feedback from, right? And, and to more, uh, basically sort of adjust your plan as is necessary. So let's just quickly go into this, um, you know, examining the value chain part of it and determining the sphere of influence. Clearly, most influence is on your own operations. Now put a mirror on these operations from a gender lens, right? So that, what does that mean? That means just take a step back and look at your own operations from a gender disaggregated data perspective, right? Uh, there are three things that perhaps sort of constitute uh, your uh, universe in which you can uh, look at your own operations. So ownership, where you probably have um, little control or power to change the existing uh, structure. Board of Directors, look at it from a gender and skill perspective. Nothing that change may not be immediate in this perspective, but at least you will have a perspective. And the employee base. And on the employee base, you could also make slice and dice the data in many ways. So one uh, absolute perhaps must is hierarchy-wise gender disaggregation. Um, looking at 
uh, how many men and women are there at at, a, at at different levels in your organization and also different locations in your organization. Um, and also look at attrition data hierarchy-wise um, in terms of gender disaggregation, right? Also look at new hires, movement, promotions data, pay data as well. Look at it from a complete non-biased perspective. Just put that information together and take a look at it. So one of the companies I had the chance to work uh, with on gender action and preparing their gender action plan, they had a majority women at the workforce. Uh, I think a staggering 86% of the workforce were uh, in that company were women. Um, I, I was obviously very excited. It was a great company. Um, so we broke that down uh, to the hierarchy level in terms of the composition. Uh, gender-wise composition, right? Um, at entry level, we could see that they had, a, a, I think, uh, about two-thirds uh, of the workforce were women at the entry level. Um, and just one level up at supervisory roles, just up the chain, there was they were just 20% women. It was interesting to understand why that was the case. Um, and that was the data that I urged them to sort of study a little bit more. Um, look at promotions, role movements, data year on year. Um, look at it from a gender disaggregated perspective, of course. And maybe a trend will emerge. And that's the trend I think you must sort of examine. Now, going to something this is so, um, I think it's so obvious, but we, and therefore maybe overlooked, is the infrastructure perspective. I was truly surprised in my experience in the past to see how infrastructure plays an important role in women participation in the labor force. There are a lot of factors at play, primarily centered around the fact of physical safety, right? Um, so, of course, well-led premises, harassment-free workplace, all of these uh, important aspects, separate, safe, and hygienic washrooms, uh, safety on work-related level. And, and the reason I say this is, I was conducting an agenda diligence at another company, and this was one of the startups. This was a while ago, um, and I, I I was speaking to all the women in the in the staff. There were not many; there were a handful of them. So I had individual conversations with each of the women in the um, at, at this uh, startup, and all of them felt uncomfortable with one thing, and that was there was just one washroom. It was a shared washroom. It was so. Um, perhaps so uh, basic and obvious, but it was something that we completely overlooked. We did not imagine that that could be uh, a significant factor is it for women to feel, um, uh, to want to continue to work at this place or to feel like they can stay longer hours and work there, right? So it was very specific to this office and the women staff there. So it is essential to listen and take feedback on these aspects well-lit pathways, ease of access to public transportation. I think all of these form, um, you need to have a gender lens when you're looking at these things. Uh, and that will sort of simplify a lot of these issues uh, on, uh, on, on the company's uh, current stance. Um, end users, so, you know, gender lens on an end user perspective, how your products and services are affecting uh, or are addressing uh, women's unique needs, uh, do they disproportionately benefit women and so on, are they easily accessible uh, to both men and women and so on, depending on the kind of your projects, uh, products, sorry. I'm, I'm going to um, not spend too much time on this and the suppliers bit here, but suffice to know that you can apply a gender lens on each of these different components. Happy to chat later, within the limited time we have, I think, um, I need to I need to keep moving. So once you have the trends from all these operator, operational perspectives, benchmark yourself. There are many leading publications that provide benchmark data, especially for financial services industry. I have seen that there's very granular data uh, on participation at each level, including uh, um, attrition. Uh, at, at the fresher, see, uh, lower management, middle management, higher management. I think there's data uh, with all kinds of these uh, benchmarks. And that's something that you could potentially take a look at. Um, there are some ready-to-use tools that could be a good starting point, uh, which is the 2x challenge criteria. 
Uh, there's also the gender smart nexus, which I learned about uh, two days ago at uh, at Sankalp. Uh, that's something you could look at. And then identify potential biases through data again. So are you hiring, for example, uh, a certain type of candidates only? Um, you know, uh, let's examine why we're doing something like that or is that the best fit and so on. Um, assess gaps on each of these data points and then uh, and then you can think about designing the programs uh, to address these gaps. Um, once you know what to address, so you break it down to what can be addressed with a reasonable amount of time and money. And one of my favorite sessions, uh, I think, with respect to gender action plan is on unconscious biases. Um, when an organization introduces this gender action plan, it is very easy to alienate a section of your uh, uh, of your employee base um, and, and to make it appear like women uh, or the diversity hires. Uh, yes, we, we will be ending in like a couple of minutes soon. Uh, we, it's very easy to look at uh, them as diversity hires and not on merit. I think it's just bring them along. All of us carry biases. It would be good to talk about them so they don't remain unconscious anymore. Um, I have a few examples uh, and, you know, happy to share them through the Q&A as well. So do's and don'ts, I think, very quickly start at the very basic. Do not assume anything. Gender action plan is not just for women. Include men as key stakeholders in implementation. Communicate and market the implemented plan. Do not do it otherwise. Do not set it out as a marketing plan that will destroy the crux of your uh, gender action. Uh, track and measure meaningful indicators, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And remember, change takes time. These things will not happen overnight. It is not reasonable to uh, assume that you will have a completely transformed organization within um, you know, a year also. So make, make sure that you understand that change takes time. And it also takes time to show up on the indicators that you're tracking. So that's it from me. Thank you so much. I know I'm over time. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much, Priya. That was really illuminating uh, from what you talked about, the deliberate and intentional efforts to narrow the gap and uh, the lessons from the workplace about uh, the fact that globally, uh, you know, there is a lag in terms of education and skills. And I think it's really important to understand the impediments and barriers uh, which need to be overcome. So uh, uh, maybe just a quick question on one aspect. You mentioned that uh, there is also the need to create, uh, raise awareness and then get the buy-in. What kind of challenges uh, have you kind of faced when, you know, practically implementing that? Because uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, our audience, uh, you know, may face that challenge. And uh, uh, then I'll take up the other questions at the end uh, so that we can get uh, uh, John's perspective. But uh, if you could just answer this uh, particular question. Yes. Thank you. No, th thanks so much, Utsav. I think it's a very interesting question. I've heard it all, Utsav. I've heard everything. I'm like, why should we hire women? Why should we go this extra mile to, uh, uh, you know, make it inclusive for women? We have an organization. Everything is working okay. Um, and and I think it's important to hear that perspective. I think it's important to, um, uh, you know, not dismiss that perspective. It is a perspective. And that's where I was thinking about that. That's where I think the first step is really to um, get the support of these, um, uh, you know, these people who probably don't believe in what you're setting out to do. I think one important point that I want to make from a gender action plan perspective is it, it helps if it is a top down um, approach. Um, but it is very important from a, from understanding perspectives and building the program bottoms up. So have the messaging clear top down. And then a lot of the people, even they are initially reluctant, will probably come along. And once they start seeing that overall it's becoming an inclusive place, it's good for them, it's, it's also nice for them, um, you know, it starts to help. Just one very quick example, you know, just before when COVID hit and, and there were a lot of people um, uh, who were working from home and this time it was both men and women. And, and when that option became available to work from home or have flexible options, 
um, I think I think even the men in the workforce sort of understood that it is something that that enables them. Um, it, it enables them to contribute to their uh, roles um, a, a, at home as well. Um, and it's not just somebody else in the home. And I think overall, it starts to bring out that perspective and and maybe just sparks a little bit of empathy. And that takes us a long way. I know it sounds a little bit um, uh, maybe not tangible, but these things do play a part. Sure. Thank you uh, for that answer, uh, Priya. Over to you, John. And uh, I'll request the organizers and audience if we can extend uh, the session by maybe just five minutes. So we ensure that we can hear John, uh, you know, completely and also take uh, questions for his uh, presentation. Thank you so much uh, for your patience, John. And uh, over to you. No, thank you so much, Yutsar. And uh, I'd like to uh, say that Priya's presentation and Srinajit's presentations were fantastic. And I think they set the tone of exactly what I'm about to um, share with you. So I just wish to confirm if you can see my full screen. Yes, we can see okay. it. Fantastic. So as Ali introduced, and for the sake of those who've just joined the call, my name is John Kabir. I am an ESG consultant and also a building surveyor by profession, founder, chief executive officer, and principal consultant at DC Group, which is essentially a professional services consultancy. More on those necessities at the end of my presentation. So um, this morning or afternoon or evening, I'm here to present an actual case study of uh, ESG integration into, uh, into a business. So this particular business is essentially um, a real estate business. And uh, in fact, uh, the company is a real estate investment trust uh, called uh, Acon Limited. So Acon Limited happened to be one of the premier developers, operators, and asset managers of rental housing in Kenya. And they have a list of firsts uh, in, in Africa. First and foremost, they're the first uh, Kenyan company to uh, issue a green bond and also the first Kenyan company to be able to cross-list the very same bond on, um, on uh, the Nairobi Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange. I mean, they're the first uh, 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 company to uh, start the student accommodation. They're the first issuance of uh, um, uh, N NSC uh, USP. They're the first uh, to do a GRES real estate ESG assessment. So basically, after with all those accolades, they felt like, they really need to bring out their ESG uh, message out to board in a very strong way. And they were also very careful to make sure that they do not greenwash the market. If they say that they've integrated ESG, they're really integrated ESG. So uh, my consultancy partnered with another consultancy and we were invited to come in and do an ESG assessment. And basically the uh, assessment was to see exactly where the company is. Already Acorn had uh, integrated ESG into their business. Already they had issued a sustainability plan. They uh, had already developed green certified accommodation to the IFC edge standard. So basically they were doing all this, but they wanted to be sure that what they are doing is really proper integration. It can be able to cascade into the entire organization and they can be able to see beyond just reporting on ESG, but go beyond reporting. And what are the steps that are needed to go beyond in, uh, reporting? So when those were the case, we were able to frame up our scope, which included our ESG assessment. Uh, we did uh, an ESG integration due diligence. Uh, we did an ESG assessment health check and a preliminary GRES scoring. And then we go, went ahead and did an e GRES ESG assessment preparation based on the health check and preliminary scoring. And then after that, we also did um, a documentation enhancement, which of course included uh, getting all the documentation which was available, some which was currently speaking about ESG or some other matters, and then making it sure that it really speaks and reflects to the ESG properly. So maybe to introduce to you about GRAS. GRAS is basically an ESG framework uh, for benchmarking um, real estate assets. So it's a global framework that assesses and benchmarks ESG uh, and also the performance of real estate assets as well as infrastructure assets. 
And uh, we recommended GRES because GRES is aligned to most of the global standards. For example, the principles for responsible investment, the TCFD, um, the SASB, um, GRI, the integrated reporting. So GRES has aligned itself to all these. So it made sense to be the appropriate framework upon which to benchmark this particular business so that we can know exactly how they are performing as far as ESG is concerned. So more about um, GRES is that it's simplified because it sort of like categorizes ESG into uh, various uh, components and aspects and indicators, which is basically a broken down language, which any person who is basically doing business can be able to understand. For example, when you talk about one of the management components, uh, it speaks about leadership. It speaks about the policies which the company has. It speaks about your reporting mechanisms. It speaks about risk management. How are you addressing all the risks which your company is faced? And uh, it talks about stakeholder engagement. So all these aspects are conversations or are terminologies or is language which is not foreign to most of the people who already run businesses, who already run enterprises. So now the question is, which are these indicators which you're supposed to look and be able to understand that you are actually doing the right thing? So there is also the performance component and the performance component basically applies to, let's say you're running a business and it has operations and those operations performance, sustainability performance needs to be assessed. And then there is the development component. Basically, let's say you're in the business of developing, creating. Um, how is that also addressed? So there are various aspects and the various aspects speak to various indicators. So this basically becomes our framework, which we use to be able to understand and score exactly what is green. So what GRES also goes and does is that for the performance component, because it's basically operations, it carries about 70% of the score. And then when you look at the management component, it talks about, or, I mean, looks at 30% of the score. And then together, they form 100. Let's say now you have operational assets, and those are the ones that you wish to, uh, they wish to assess. And then let's say you have development assets. So you can take the management component, which is 30%, and then development component, which is now 70%. And let's say you have both, for example, like in Akon's case, where they have both operational assets and also development assets, because they develop and then they manage what they develop. So they were able to get two benchmark reports. So there's one benchmark for the uh, operational and there's another benchmark for the, uh, for the uh, development. But of course, the management component or the management score applies on both sides. So, and when you get the reports, the reports from GRASS are able to tell you areas where you've you performed well, areas where you perform performed poorly. And that reporting is able to take you back and do a proper analysis, see where you need to improve, and then apply those uh, particular improvements. So we felt like this was the appropriate framework, which was suitable for um, this uh, uh, GRASS, who are real estate uh, developers and operators, to be able to see their ESG performance and then be able to go beyond just reporting and do much better than that. So the entire process was a very, uh, a, a very complicated process. It was very uh, iterative, uh, very engaging and intensive because it involved uh, several aspects uh, and processes. Number one, it involved uh, receiving as many as 170 uh, documents which we reviewed. And these documents, we had to keep on requesting for these documents because we understood the kind of documents that we knew they are supposed to have. We understood exactly what needs to be in those very documents, and we had to assess those documents and see whether they are doing it. So we also had to do um, real-time surveys and, I mean, physical visits to all their assets and properties. We had to meet with uh, management. We had to talk to management. We conducted our numerous interviews. And in all these interviews, we wanted to understand um, whether the board understood uh, ESG integration, whether top management understood ESG integration, and also whether the staff uh, understood uh, the integration. And you realize that um, even with a, a very uh, progressive company like um, Econ, there were some staff members who were not really uh, conversant with uh, ESG. All they knew is that some of the aspects and elements of ESG 
but just best practices which Echo describes to. And that's correct. They have those best practices, but then they were not these careful or deliberate efforts to do so. So in some of the interviews and workshops which we had with them, we were able to tell them more about ESD. And the beauty about that is that some of the ideas to enhance the strategies did not necessarily need to come from us, the, uh, the ESG consultants, but they actually came from the staff themselves because they had, I mean, they, they knew where the pain points were, they knew areas where they could easily improve, and they had suggestions to even to some of those issues to do with uh, ESG. We also discovered that also during the same process, we were able to also interact with some of their suppliers to the supply chain because when it comes to ESG, you also have to influence your supply chain because it doesn't make sense to say that we have a sustainable product, but then when you look at your supply chain, you realize that one of your suppliers maybe has some very terrible environmental practices that they have to use to be able to deliver something which you feel like it's green. So you have to look into that. And as a developer, you have to look at, as a development company, you also have to look at the con contractors they use. Some of the contractors really did not understand issues to do with health and safety. So we had to look into issues to do with uh, deaths or accidents and such. We had to look into near misses because some of these things speak volumes, especially to ESG. For instance, a near miss could tell you that chances are that you could easily injure somebody. So change some of those methods or some of those ways that you're doing so that you reduce the number of uh, near misses because it's like you are running on a borderline. You're exposing yourself too much to external risk that can easily make you lose your social license. And uh, social license is very, very instrumental when it comes to ESG implementation. And no company should basically lose its social license because that's where you lose the trust of the customers. That's where you lose the trust of the banking institutions, the ones who lend money to you, especially if they have very high ESG standards themselves, which they'd like their customers, their clients, which is maybe you, the client, you, the business, to be able to, uh, to, be able to ascribe to. So basically looking at that, all that full circle involved a lot of uh, reviewing of documents, involved a lot of uh, introducing new processes which are not there. And then after doing that, we were able to prepare the, the, uh, the um, we were able to prepare the assets, we were able to prepare the documents for the GRASP um, submission. So after the feedback on the en enhancement of documentation with the company, we were able to do the submission. And then once we did the submission, we submitted to GRASP and they were able to be um, scored and certified. So uh, among the things that we did, especially the operational part, was to understand the environmental, social, and governance performance of individual assets, as well as the management. For example, um, all the assets did not know how they were performing, especially when it comes to energy use, water, waste, and transportation. I'm saying so because the data was there, but then the data was not normalized to be able to give you the actual picture. For example, if I tell you a 10,000 square foot building uses maybe 1,000 liters, it, you may not understand it until maybe you understand that maybe another building, maybe 5,000 square feet is also using 1,000 liters. So now that's where you ask yourself whether am I doing well or am I being poorly? So that normalization of data. So what we did is that we got all their assets and we were able to upload their data onto the app platform which gave them a proper performance of how a real estate asset is able to, to do. And it gave them a simple score. For example, on the screen, you can see a 49 and a 51. And that's a language uh, which most of the staff will easily understood. So we forgot about the, uh, the BTUs of this world, the liters and everything, and then compressed all that information into a simple score. And that simple score was able to uh, help them understand. And also this simple information is also very quick when it comes to reporting. So which means it reduced the administrative uh, work of uh, collecting information, analyzing the information. So it was all automated and uh, things went well. So what are the outcomes of all these, um, uh, of, all, of all this entire process? Number one, we were able to develop a, gas and, a gap analysis report. Uh, which gave uh, immediate recommendations on what we can be able to integrate and also what can they be able to integrate in future. 
So what we were able to do with the draft analysis report too is that we were able to age the uh, the measures and say that this will be the short term measures that you can introduce. These are going to be the intermediate uh, in the intermediate term, and these are going to be the long term plans that you are able to in, uh, to introduce. And uh, I'm happy to even say that uh, they were able to be ranked number one in Africa after the assessments and what we did for them. And also they were globally ranked number three in their particular peer group. And that's for the um, investment uh, investment rate and also for the deal rate. And I'm also happy to say that um, this year they've they have improved on their particular score. And that improvement is courtesy of the implementation of the recommendations which were in the gap analysis report. And then number two, we were able to um, come up with indicators which the, the ESG indicators that they are supposed to look at constantly so that they may not drop the ball, so that they may, keep, they may be kept on reminded on what to do and how to track their performance. We uh, provided them with our templates which they're able to use on a regular basis so that they're able to do the right thing. We provided a preliminary health check report and scoring on the grades assessment and that also went a long way in seeing where they can be able to improve and they were able to improve uh, on that. And then ultimately we gave them an ESG assessment um, report. And also that's a report which they got from Grez. And uh, they were able now to see how they actually performed and they saw the areas of weakness. They were able to compare the report and the gap analysis. And they also show that truly that the weak areas are where they were as for the gap analysis report. They were able to introduce a few of those recommendations as for the plan, and that way they've been able to successfully, uh, in, in, they've been able to successfully um, improve on their ESG score. So basically, this whole process is similar to what um, Priya just uh, spoke about, uh, that particular process. It's only that I just did a little bit of a deep dive into, into that, so that you can be able to understand that it's actually applicable. And the good thing about this whole process, and what I can say is that, it's not costly to, uh, to a company to actually integrate uh, ESG because most of the things, the indicators of the activities that you do within ESG, these are things that we naturally uh, do on a regular basis. It's just a matter of uh, looking at them, seeing how we're doing them, and then making a plan on how to improve on what you're doing. So basically, that was my presentation. And so to end my slide with the nice so those are my qualifications and that's my company and uh, let's engage. So that's my presentation and I turn it back to you yourself. Great, thank you so much, John. Really interesting. I liked uh, how you emphasized in the beginning that Acorn Holdings was actually doing the ESG exercise and not just doing greenwashing. Could you give some practical indication of what is it that the company did which convinced you that they were serious about ESG and not just doing greenwashing? Maybe one or two examples. And the uh, second thing I would like to also is you emphasize the need for checking on uh, not only what your company does, but also looking into the supply chain of uh, the company. Because often, as we all know in this field, the emissions from scope three, which is the emissions from your supply chain, are much larger than your own operations. So being able to influence uh, the supply chain is really, really important and uh, talk to your uh, dependent uh, companies. So, um, yeah, firstly, what was the thing about uh, ACORN which convinced you of their seriousness? And secondly, uh, any comments on engaging with the supply chain in a meaningful manner? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Yutsa, for those questions. So when we walked in, we realized that, number one, uh, ACORN had an ESG strategy. They, number two, they had an ESG uh, committee. But of course, the composition of the committee is where we felt like this needs to be enhanced. But the beautiful thing about that is that there was a committee in place. And number three, they had um, an, um, a sustainability policy, which already, for instance, spoke that all the developments are supposed to be um, e I mean, uh, green certified. So basically, already they were speaking to um, most of the elements which or the practicalities that uh, any real estate company can do as far as E is concerned. And they're also keen to keep um, their data on how they, uh, I mean, the data that comes from the assets um, which operate. 
So these three were very instrumental because one, there was a policy, there was a committee, and there was a strategy on ESG. So basically those three were definitely there. The commitment was there. And one of the board members actually steered uh, the uh, ESG committee. So already the commitment was there. So the, the only thing that wasn't there is that it had not cascaded uh, down properly and most of the uh, staff had not understood it. And that's where we came in to set up the proper workshops. And then when you talk about staff, and then by extension, the, the supply chain also wasn't that conversant, but it's always good to uh, engage the supply chain because when we did so, apparently we had some interesting discoveries. For instance, when it came to the waste management parts, um, Acon did not have the data on their waste management, but their waste contractor had data on the waste that they, they normally collect from uh, Acon. So the question was that they, as a company, were not asking for it, but their contractor had the, the data. And number two, to go deeper, apparently the waste contractor was also segregating the waste that was coming in from, uh, from, uh, from Acon. But of course, he was also not disclosing that. So what we did is that we had a sitting with uh, the waste contractor, for instance, we showed him how they can be able to report our waste data. They, uh, they diverted waste from landfills and what goes to the landfill. And we were able to provide them with uh, templates on, on how to fill the information. So they were quickly able to do so. And apparently that worked in their favor because they learned something new and that's something new. Apparently they used it to get another job of uh, waste marketing contracting because they were able to tell the client that we are able to collect your waste and we are able to divert it and we are able to give you reports on how you're supposed to, uh, on how you can report. So in case you have any sustainability reporting that you're doing, you are in a position to do so and at a particular price. And just by that, we were able to help that young company to get more business by just telling them on what to do. So to us as uh, the ESD consultant, we were excited and happy because they exact, essentially, that's the impact that we want to see among society. Ask yourself if all waste management contractors will do so. You will see that we are able to minimize the amount of waste that actually goes into the, uh, into the environment. Thank you. Thank you, John. That's a great answer. And uh, it also speaks to Priya's point about how it needs to be driven from top down, but you also need bottom up programs to be implemented. And it's great to hear that uh, uh, also that uh, the young company was able to create that jobs uh, in a circular economy. You know, this is a, basically an example of circular economy because they were already doing good practices. And I think it tells us also not to assume that people or companies downstream are not doing anything. They're also aware and they also want to do things. So that's really important. Um, thank you for that. I uh, recognize we're at the end of our session, but uh, we have some more time before the next session starts in about 15 minutes. So I will go directly into the questions. And uh, this, these questions are for all the panelists. Uh, uh, so feel free to kind of answer and jump in as uh, you would like to. Uh, the latest question was from Stephen Ramsey. He was asking about how can companies uh, wishing to embrace ESG navigate regulatory environments that are not supportive or even hostile towards ESG? In Texas, for example, the state legislature recently banned local governments from doing business with banks that have ESG policies. And also in many developing countries, they have a race to bottom mentality, which makes it difficult for ESG conscious companies to uh, compete. And a very important and fair question. Uh, who would like to take that? I think I can take it up. So, that's sure. okay. yeah, I mean, the answer uh, it's not explicit, but there'll be, uh, number one, there'll be always challenges and risks uh, uh, from this path and there'll be uh, entities with vested interests, but we'll have to find that optimal balance uh, between all this because this is, uh, I mean, you, we have to each have our choices and uh, to, to create value, as I said, as I'm uh, saying every time that this more of a like, creation of value, not just for others, but for yourself. So end of the day, it's beneficial to yourself to uh, choose that path, which path to tread and everything, despite the regulations and everything. Regulations can only help you to one, to a certain extent, but beyond that, it's your decision how to tread that path. Yeah. Thank Maybe you. Great. Can in as yeah. well. 
Go ahead, John. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, I think uh, you know ESG is uh, is about uh, an aggregation of uh, various practices, and uh, it's up to us, we in the industry, to actually name them ESG. So if you feel that those aggregation of practices really bring uh, enterprise value to your business, then go ahead and uh, do them, and don't brand them as ESG in that particular market where there are regulations or restrictions. But then. Just remember that uh, we live in a global world and there are other areas which can actually, which do appreciate and embrace ESG. And that means that you are not limiting yourself to that particular state of Texas, but you are opening yourself up to the entire globe. So which means that you still can be able to do your business in Texas, but at the same time, you're also able to expand your value or your business beyond Texas and into other countries or other regions which do embrace that. And you don't fall short of that. And that way, if you have a fiduciary duty to your shareholders or your investors, I think you'll be doing well. So by just understanding that, you'll be able to um, overcome or navigate some of those restrictions and they cannot be able to, they won't be slapped on you. Thank you. What's up, you're on mute. Uh... Thank you, John. And thank you, Swamajit. Uh, really helpful answers. And I, uh, Stephen, I hope that answers your question. Feel free to get in touch with us afterwards um, if you would like to uh, discuss further. Uh, the ne next two questions are for Priya. Uh, Mariko is asking about gender equity versus equality. Uh, many companies uh, seemingly oversimplify and think that given, giving women equal access to jobs leads to equitable outcomes. Please elaborate between difference between gender equality and gender equity and how this matters to companies. I think you might have answered that to some uh, question, but I, I'll, I'll, I mean, if you want to expand, feel free. Let me just also ask you the second question, which is from Stella. She talks about how do you incentivize gender mainstreaming in enterprises who primarily focus on income generation and do not immediately see the re returns of gender mainstreaming and hence don't invest much into this. Um, so thank you, Stella, and thank you, Mariko, for your questions. Uh, Priya, I'm happy to repeat the questions if needed. Thanks. Thanks so much, Utsa. Uh, and thanks for the questions. Um, so, you know, the first question on gender equity versus gender equality. Um, it's a good question, but just, again, um, going back to my earlier sort of uh, a warning, right? do not get carried away with these kind of jargons. Um, I think it the um, uh, what, what what I would urge you to sort of uh, be attentive towards is what is it really trying to achieve? And what is the has that been achieved or not? Right? So from this question on by just creating equal access, to hire women, uh, is it really helping um, uh, gender equity in that sense? Um, I I would think that it is uh, just one part of of your perhaps the idea of having an equal um, opportunity workplace. Um, is uh, the first part is to create that opportunity like to create or um, make opportunities available irrespective of uh, gender and therefore to, to perhaps an equal base. Um, and the second part is uh, in order to achieve that equal workplace, you will require uh, policies and practices and procedures across the life cycle of an employee in, in the organization to also be inclusive. Um, in in many ways, so uh, you know, uh, we've, we've there was a very common saying that uh, uh, diversity is being invited to the uh, party, and inclusion is being asked for a dance, right? Like so, it's really um, I think it is it is how you you're calling everybody and you're making that space, but if they are unable to contribute once inside the organization. But you will perhaps see that trend very soon um, if you if you keep an eye out on the data that something is not working. Um, that I think that becomes quite evident, and then and then it is up to like really looking at what is not working. Um, I I hope that answers the question. Um, but but it was a really good question. Uh, so thanks for asking those uh, questions. Um, the second one was on uh, I believe 
financial um if there if you know somebody wants to do something for women and if there are no financial opportunities then it gets dropped off um i i think i think that is true um uh, if there is if there is no reasonable commercial basis um companies will perhaps not uh, be uh, uh you know in the in the uh, uh, likelihood of funding these kind of uh, products um and and that's that's just commercials at play right um and and you have to admit that businesses are here ultimately to create financial wealth also to their shareholders and stakeholders um and uh, they are not in the business of uh philanthropy or charity and and i think that's a very important distinction to make um and even as investors uh they will look at commercial viability also i think that is of course the primary um aspect and and it is necessary therefore to create that business case uh if if, if it is not making commercial sense then maybe the approach has to be changed or you might want to speak to the uh, end users or consumers and see what are they willing to pay for how are they willing to pay for it and if that is something that your company might be willing to do uh, or incorporate in its uh, uh, in its bouquet of services um i i think it, it is a great question and and it is it is something that i hear very often and um do keep the commercial lens on it, it is ultimately a business and uh, that 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 needs to also be there um within the construct of some of the ethics and um and within the construct of the what you as a company will stand for and the ethics in which uh, it operates great thanks priya uh, i hope that answers the question uh, two final questions from the audience i think they are related to each other one is uh, what are some of the data collection and management standard norms used by entrepreneurs and the last one by sindhu is uh, if we all want to understand esg reports better which would be a good place to start so uh, uh, feel free anyone to kind of jump in i think uh, priya you mentioned about the 2x challenge as a potential tool so for the gender action plan aspect if anyone wants to understand how to do that that could be a good place to start um and uh, uh, any of the speakers if they would like to share what what to use and where to start for entrepreneurs yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. i can yeah. yeah please no no go ahead samjit yeah i just wanted to come in i mean uh, there are a couple of slides it could take like if you allow me 30 seconds so sir i can just run through the slides because visuals are much better to understand so uh, if you can just put up the slides so sir uh, so from the step you you're on mute uh sure just opening the yeah just go to the where it starts from step 1 I think someone asked about the steps to be followed. Yeah, just opening. Can everybody? Let me just share the screen. Yeah. Is it visible? Yes, it is. We can just okay. straight go to the uh, slide starting with step one. Step one. All right. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Yes. Uh, so, just quickly uh, to the steps, uh, what, uh, how to go through the ESG uh, thing. So, this is uh, straight diving into the uh, performance analysis and uh, action implementation and strategy and everything. So, it's an end-to-end -end sort of thing. So, you start with basically uh, analyzing as to what level of maturity you are at, or uh, analyzing your performance. So, you start collecting all the data with respect to what policies you have. what actions you are taking what measures you are uh, uh, you have implemented what are the disclosures certifications and all those things and then there's a scoring framework you can there are lots of scoring frameworks like eco edis and gri and all those things which you can follow or you can have your own sort of thing on which you can like understand as to and you can benchmark yourself with all your peers in the same sector in the same geography as to understand where you are with respect to if you can see in there uh, in the below segment uh, there's a sort of like indicative a uh, scoring uh, pattern and you can tell yourself whether you're a follower uh, whether you're at a mature level or you're an innovator uh, next one 
Yeah, and then of course the most uh, important step, which is materiality assessment. As I said, I mean double materiality. You so you understand what you want, how what is important for your business, what is important for your stakeholders, external stakeholders, so both internal, external, inside out, outside in. You do that assessment, and then what you get as an output is a materiality map. So what uh, that tells you is like prioritizing what are important to your uh, to the entire ecosystem, your business and your stakeholders, and how to. What and how to prioritize the, all those issues, which which have been like shortlisted on your maturity map. Uh, next one. So all these will be basically feeding to your uh, sustainability or ESG strategy that you'll be developing. So these are the inputs that you are gathering. Uh, next, once you get the issues shortlisted, you do sort of a SWOT analysis as to what are important, uh, which gives you the opportunities, which gives you the strengths, and what are the risks, what poses as risks and challenges, where are your weaknesses, and accordingly. You, all these again, the outputs you get on the risk management part, you feed into into the uh, strategy. Uh, next comes the strategy part. Yeah. So uh, all these inputs, based on all these inputs, you develop your ESG strategy. What it is? It is basically the action plan that you need to have in place with regard to your uh, the compliance, with regard to your own business model. You develop the goals. You develop have the KPIs and targets, and you have the timelines also, which is very important as to when and how you have to. Uh, achieve those targets and uh, goals that you set for yourself that you set with regard to the compliance and all these things next one uh, of course after the strategy you have to have the action plan uh, detailed action plan so you start implementing you start developing the business cases for each of the activities you start getting uh, internal approvals you start having monitoring action plans all these in place qa qcs and everything you have the tools in place to uh, the the resources the uh, teams in place reporting structures and you start implementing all these things uh, next one and finally uh, you uh, sorry the pre final part is basically you start measuring the outcomes the outputs and the outcomes and you start aligning them with the uh, preferably the sdgs because we have a couple of standards which will come to on the last slide Next slide, uh, which uh, tell you how to align them with the SDGs. So this is basically a uh, indicative picture as to uh, we have basically rearranged the SDGs with re regard to the three verticals of E, S, and G. So uh, we can you can do it anywhere, anyhow you want. So according to the standards, there is a standard from W uh, World Economic Forum also, which has been developed by the uh, four or five companies together. So they tell you how to align the metrics, how to align the goals and outcomes with the uh, SDGs. Uh, last one. Yeah, so this uh, basically this slide uh, gives you an overview of all the standards. So there's a plethora, basically, and you have to choose uh, very carefully with guidance from the experts as uh, or through internal discussions as to what suits your uh, company, your sector, your region, your country best. So there are all these global frameworks from uh, GRI, OECD, UNGC, CDP, equity principles. So based on which sector you're from, you may be from banking, you may be from manufacturing. Uh, you adopt one of these standards. There are, again, lots of management systems, ISO-based management systems, which give you additional guidance or uh, broad-based guidance as to what needs to be done based on each E, S, and G like, uh, management, uh, management systems. And finally, the compliances with regard to national compliances and international compliances. There are lots of international treaties which are uh, 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 coming down with principles and uh, standards and guidelines with regard to each sector, with regard to each region. And there are national compliances uh, uh, for reporting, sustainability reporting, and responsibility, social responsibility, and all those things. And finally, in the uh, box in, at the bottom, you can find uh, certain standards which have been developed by companies, large companies like Walmart, IKEA. They have their own standards, right? And uh, there are lots of other smaller standards which these companies ask their supply chain companies to follow. And reporting according, uh, according to all those frameworks and standards. So this is basically an overview. And with uh, like once you start discussing internally, once you start uh, interacting with your stakeholders and everyone, you will get an idea as to where to start from. So you start with the maturity assessment, go on to the maturity assessment, develop your strategy after the SWOT analysis and everything, lay out the action plan, measure your outcomes, and finally choose the right reporting framework. And of course, avoid greenwashing and eyewashing and uh, make a transparent and credible reporting. So I hope that answers the question. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, really appreciate the patience of the audience and all the speakers for staying on uh, for so long, all the way to the uh, conclusion of this session.
uh, please feel free to get in touch. Um, I've been asked to also just share the fact that uh, there'll be a launch of a upcoming challenge fund for uh, India-based uh, civil society organizations. Please uh, keep checking IntelliCap social media pages and LinkedIn and Twitter to get further details and get in touch with me if you would like more information. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to our speakers and experts for uh, their time and uh, sharing all of their insights uh, from their practical experience. We really appreciate it, and uh, we hope that the audience had a fruitful and productive engagement. Thank you, and wish you all the next day, and I think uh, next, wish you all a great day, and hope you can you know join the next sessions which are starting now. Thank you.